So, global challenges for local solutions. Uh, Case invited me here to reflect a bit on uh, Will Steffen's talk and to connect it to ongoing research here at the University of Groningen. Um, Professor Steffen outlined a massive set of problems that play out at the global scale. And as humans, we strongly have often a tendency to seek solutions for the problems at the level at which they're identified. So it might be the easiest way out to think, well, some kind of global government, some vereniging van eigenaren of the global building should actually address and solve these. But that is actually not true, and it will not happen, as we all know. So it is quite critical that we now translate these global challenges to local solutions solutions on the ground and see how we can address them. So uh, connecting to that uh, talk of him, uh, first let's go to his uh, planetary boundaries again. He uh, identified a number of interesting regions where we are cur currently trespassing the boundaries of the world. Uh, nitrogen cycling is one of them, and in the Netherlands we're all aware that our global management of nitrogen in the agricultural landscape is something that is a big unsolved problem at this moment, where actually ecological problems and legal problems and social problems and economic future of our agricultural system both all join uh, together, so clearly a local problem now contributing to global solutions, and also will indicate that our trespassing of the boundaries of uh, biodiversity change on this planet. And I would like to start with that aspect first, so biodiversity. And I fully agree with him that we're currently at an important crossroads as humanity. Do we turn right? And to the right means on the way is business as usual. And as you can see with the cyclist, we have already probably taken that road. Or do we turn back and, and do we choose the somewhat less traveled road, road uh, to the left? And, and I use those directions uh, on purpose because as ecologists, we can't avoid anymore that what we do also has a political consequence. It's not free academic uh, philosophizing, but it means that actually the voting choices of the public will determine in the end whether we will be able to address uh, the challenges as, as we see them on the global scale. So what direction will we take? Well, Will uh, clearly outlined uh, the necessity for action and this necess necessity uh, operates both on uh, the water, underwater, and on the land. Starting underwater, um, this was an inspiring figure uh, made 20 years ago by Daniel Pauly, who introduced the term fishing down the food web. He made the point that by over-exploiting our seas, we increasingly degrade the diversity and the complexity and the functioning of our marine systems both on sea floors and in the pelagic parts of the sea of the food web. And I'm just showing this slide because this is also something we practically investigate. At our university, we recently started uh, a large project funded by the northern provinces and by the Waddenfonds, um, addressing restoration options for the Wadden Sea. The Wadden Sea, just next door, is one of the largest intertidal ecosystems in the world. It has been severely degraded. And as scientists, we have done a long uh, effort of documenting these changes, but now we move to restoration mode because we start seeing how can we restore and recover by sometimes active interventions and by, something, uh, by sometimes by just protecting areas much better, how can we re restore the key functions and operations of these uh, type of areas. So we try to not only determine that we have trespassed environmental boundaries, but we also see what do we need to do to actually trace back on our steps to take that turn left that we want to make because we realize we've taken the wrong turn. Because of time, I, I can't go into uh, the work uh, on this uh, area yet. Instead, I want to move to uh, terrestrial systems and to farming. Because we can draw an analogy that in our beautiful landscapes, as we see them around us as well, and uh, it's good that just now there's a farming slide uh, just behind me, we, s we see that Although the landscape is still beautiful, if we would look on the, on the square meter, uh, probably in this wheat uh, field, uh, we have severely what we call farmed down the food web. So also there, we have simplified agricultural systems strongly to our needs. We have simplified systems where just those elements of food webs 
the plants that are our crops, uh, the grasses that are eaten by the cows for which we use the dairy, we have strongly simplified any kind of superfluous pathways and flows in the, uh, in the fabric of life uh, around us. And as a, as a result, we have lost diversity from our agricultural landscapes. And is that a problem? Yes, that is a problem. It substantially impairs our capacity to provide a continuous food supply for feeding the world. And in addition, it strongly reduces all kind of environmental services that those agricultural systems provide to us. Because this landscape is not only producing food, uh, it's also producing a landscape in which we live. Uh, it's providing uh, buffers for, uh, for high water protection. It is providing a carbon sink. There's all these range, ranges of functions that are provided by us. And by just focusing on more and more productivity squeezed out of these agricultural systems, we're really losing essential functions. So in these agricultural landscapes, there's a strong need to what's called bend the curve of biodiversity loss. In a paper uh, just published uh, a few weeks ago by uh, Leclerc and colleagues in Nature, strongly driven by uh, the, 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 the work by WWF, uh, there is this strong call for now, how do we now retrace on our step and actually take a turn towards a more sustainable future. And this bending the biodiversity curve is something that is urgently now needed because we have trespassed these global planetary boundaries, but we should not settle for that and we should try to, to recover actually uh, the, the big changes that are happening at this moment. So we should step up our conservation efforts and agricultural systems are a good place to start because they're substantial uh, areas where this, uh, this uh, biodiversity that supports many functions has been lost. So how do we do this? So uh, this paper outlines a couple of possible interventions that I will use as a narrative also to show some of our work in this respect. So it has been argued that simply increasing land under conservation. And this is true both for our marine systems, probably also true for the Wadden Sea, where despite its world heritage status, we still allow quite intensive fishing. Uh, it is also true for uh, many of our uh, nature areas in the Netherlands, and it's also world true for our uh, uh, nature worldwide. And I'll show later uh, examples of that work that we do abroad. Uh, it's also important to reduce the environmental impacts of our agriculture, of our food systems. Um, and one call of this paper is to generalize landscape level conservation planning. And that's actually an interesting call because that's a theme where our sustainable society work at Groningen, that we call sustainable landscapes, is right in the middle of. And another call already mentioned in the discussion this morning, a call for more plant-based diets. Because all this wheat behind you as, as, as grown in the province of Groningen does not go into your bread as you might uh, want to think, but it all goes into pigs. And those pigs go into meat and those, that meat is exported mostly to Germany and Austria. Right? So, so we're, that's, that's how we currently see our food production systems at, uh, at the regional uh, scale. So uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Pablo Titonel, Professor of Agroecology here at the University of Groningen, also present here, uh, did an interesting uh, recent analysis to show actually what kind of system level changes are needed in our agricultural uh, systems. And it's simply um, a simple economic analysis. It starts with that if we increase our land use intensity, we use more fertilizer, we use more pesticides, uh, we use uh, heavier and deeper tilling uh, regimes, then simply our profit productivity of our systems is increased. So we, at first glance, get a higher benefit from these systems. So from an economic perspective, you might say, well, okay, strive for as much as possible productivity. But of course, uh, economic analysis also include a cost. And, and one cost is that um, this increasing productivity goes at the extent of biodiversity. It can be argued that some human land use intensity is actually beneficial for biodiversity, but this is usually only at small scales. At a regional scale, species generally are lost, but locally you can compress more species on top of each other because of environmental heterogeneity. 
But there's also, of course, the economic production cost of, of realizing that, uh, that revenue. So the gross revenue, you need to subtract the production cost. And, and usually uh, this uh, land use, in this production cost of, uh, of agricultural produce goes up in a different way than uh, the productivity. The productivity reaches a carrying capacity. So at some point, uh, there needs to be a cost-benefit analysis. What is the optimal intensity of land use from an economic perspective? Well, that sounds obvious. You would say somewhere in the middle, right? There you have the biggest, uh, um, the, the biggest gross profit. But it's not as obvious as that, because there's different interests and different agents involved, right? So one can say that from the perspective of um, of the processing industry and the banks and the international competition and low prices for computer consumers, there's a strong tendency to actually push productivity to as high as possible, even where the margins for the farmer are actually smaller. Because So it shows that there's a conflict of interest of actually where an individual farmer from his own economic uh, analysis should sit and where actually uh, the agro-industry actually wants that farmer to sit. I think that summarizes a lot of the current debate and conflict that we see in, in our operation of agricultural uh, systems uh, already. Um, so, how can we change this balance? Well, um, what we want to do is actually lower land use intensity to benefit biodiversity. And one first step may be actually to protect farmers more from international free markets. This is, of course, strongly against the neoliberal philosophy, as, as Will uh, called it. But it might be needed that actually we just need to realize that agricultural production is one of the services to our society, and that not only the agricultural product is a product, but also the landscape and the healthy environment are also, also need to be included. One way to do that is actually um, start fumbling around with the shape of these different curves. So one intervention might be that consumers simply need to pay higher prices for the products produced at lower land use intensities, right? Then you change the blue curve and you actually increase the profits at lower intensity of the land and therefore you drive more the curve uh, to the left. It can also be by relocating uh, subsidies uh, from high intensity, low intensity agriculture. Strangely enough, we subsidize a system which makes, means actually making this high intensity agriculture is more, product, more profitable relative to, than low intensity uh, products. Well, through subsidies and taxes, uh, we can actually change that balance, change the brown curve, simply making low intensity farming more profitable and more competitive. And this also includes so-called uh, including externalities, the true pricing, um, uh, what, what is meant, right? Currently, uh, a lot of the uh, emissions, for example, from agriculture as uh, carbon dioxide emissions, but also especially nitrogen emissions, actually the farmers don't need to pay for the costs actually of accommodating the negative impacts of these uh, things. And maybe that needs to be part of the, of the price of the products as it's being uh, realized. And um, finally, uh, we can also change uh, the green curve. So we can optimize actually agricultural systems in such a way that at the same level of intensity, the produced biodiversity of the landscape is quite a bit larger. This we call making sustainable agricultural landscapes. And this is also a topic of active research in our university at this moment. So. Um, for example, uh, I will skip through some examples quickly. Uh, we have been mapping land use intensity in the province uh, of Friesland um, in the Netherlands. And um, uh, here you see the southwest uh, part of Friesland. And, and using novel satellite technology, radar-based uh, satellites, we can actually map the intensity of land use and, and how, how often um, uh, farmers are cutting the grass and how much they are fertilizing it. And we can link this using tracking data by my colleagues here, uh, Teunus Piersma and Ruth Howison, uh, on how uh, endangered farmland birds like this black-tailed godwit, how they're using the landscape. And we can map, actually, what their preferred habitats are and meanwhile, it shows that yeah, they clearly prefer the lower uh, intensity landscapes, uh, the, the, the green and the yellow, especially in the middle. So some agricultural use is good. But we're not doing a good job in spatially arranging their different habitats in such a way that these populations survive. Because meanwhile, if we look at the landscape level trends of the Dutch population, this species is in a linear decline, right? So we're not doing a good job in actually uh, organizing the structure of our landscapes in such a way that the life cycle requirements of these species are being filled. So this we call 
life cycle landscapes. It means that you probably know uh, this toy that you may have provided, uh, uh, may have been provided as a, as a kit, if you still remember, or you may provide it to your own kits, where you need to fit like a circle and a triangle and a square in the same box. And the same perspective you can take for the life cycle of an animal. It has different things to do throughout a year. It has to breed, it has to forage, it has to rest somewhere inside the breeding season, outside the breeding season. And all these requirements of its life cycle need to be fulfilled, right? And only if all these different shapes, so to say, these are different colors in the landscape are present, then actually a species can fulfill its life cycle. So this, from the ecology of the species that we want to protect, we can optimize the spatial arrangement of, life, of landscapes from a, from a life cycle perspective of species. My colleague uh, Raymond Klaassen, for example, is doing this now uh, in, in, in real. And for example, looking at these yellow wagtails, quantifying where do they breed, where do they go for foraging, and what do they get there, right? So this is learning how they actually assemble their, their diet throughout uh, the breeding season. And it also tells you something about the optimal spatial arrangements for getting populations like this in your, uh, in your landscapes. We do this work on uh, what's called nature-inclusive agriculture in a regional context. And this regional context is a recently cut uh, regio deal, Natuur Inclusieve Landbouw Noord-Nederland, which means uh, a national program where uh, regions get actually large governmental subsidies for uh, making actually um, uh, landscapes uh, more sustainable. And in this case, we collaborate with uh, the northern provinces and with the higher education institutions in, in the north, but also with Wageningen University, actually to make a number of regional pilots to try out these um, methods of landscape optimization. And this is again embedded in a national context, what is called the Delta Plan Biodiversity Restoration for the Netherlands, where uh, also now uh, the, uh, the, the industry, the agro industry and the banks have joined and, and also the supermarkets have joined and teamed up together with research institutions to jointly try to find solutions for this reverting uh, the current biodiversity loss in the agricultural landscapes. So, so much for our regional initiatives. Now, globally, uh, if we move there, we see increasing land under conservation management as an important goal. And um, this relates to the sustainable development goals as already outlined. The sustainable development goals are great and they're devised in a smart way so that there's a lot of synergies between many of them where people are becoming convinced if you do something about poverty, you help the environment and if you make clean water, you also get clean drinking water, but also this also helps the wet uh, biosphere. But unfortunately, there's also important trade-offs. Not all these sustainable development goals go together. So currently, there's a lot of work going on mapping these different uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, big concerns in that regard are for Africa. In Africa, we see that over the next 50 years, actually, we see the amount of poverty increasing. And this in poverty, the increasing poverty is putting, putting a major constraint on actually the global sustainability of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the SDGs as we try to achieve them. Yeah. Um, we see that this is driving land use change where um, Poverty and strong dependence on the land, and, and especially in rural areas, actually pushes away the coexistence of humans and wildlife away from nature with low human impact towards human-dominated rural landscapes that have lost a lot of their biodiversity and also uh, increasing urban landscapes. So big challenges, because of time, I can't say a lot of it, but around the Serengeti ecosystem and at the border of uh, Tanzania and Kenya, we've, mapping, we've been mapping the last remaining migratory systems uh, of wildebeest, which are uh, still coexisting with people, but actually are ch strongly under pressure. And we've actually come up with ways to quantify why and how these systems are actually collapsing. We also here use remote sensing derived combined with ground observations. Uh, observations here, a paper in Science of last year where we map actually the extent of fires in the landscape and see how the contraction of the fires coincides with the breakdown of human wildlife coexistence and therefore also putting priorities of where the coexistence of these uh, people and wildlife can be combined. So here we have a complex puzzle 
that um, uh, was already addressed by Eleanor Orstrom in her, um, in her books, Principles for Managing the Commons, Resources that Belong to No One. This holds on the global scale, like Stefan outlined, but it also holds on the local scale. And here we use this actually as a framework to really see that in places where these kind of um, principles are not adhered to, so when there's no clear monitoring of agreed behaviors, when there's no sanctions, when there's no, not a fair uh, distribution of costs and, cost and benefits through stakeholders, we see actually this breakdown of the global coexistence and, and local coexistence of people and wildlife. So finally, how to bend the curve of biodiversity loss. Repairing a system that is broke requires that you really know how it works. So when I bring my car to the shop, I hope that this mechanic actually knows how it works. So what we need to do is we really need to combine the discovery of fundamental principles organ uh, underlying the organization of ecosystems with an inclusive process of stake all stakeholders and testing alternative solutions at the landscape scale. We need to do those simultaneously. There's no time anymore to do this in the classic order of the, of the iterative uh, scientific circle. So we need to ditch classic distinctions between fundamental and applied research or between research and management and we need to do it all together and we need to do it right now. Thank you.